So uh, one time, uh, Jesus is uh, approached by this, this guy who's really respected in the community. He's a leader. He's an influencer. He's a recognized authority on their Hebrew scriptures, a teacher of Torah, of the religious law. And the teacher asks him, the teacher asks, hey, Jesus, out of all of the commandments, what's most important? There, there were 613 commandments in the Hebrew scriptures. That was well known. And the question is like, the, the, the quest is for a unifying principle, kind of like Lord of the Rings, the one ring to rule them all, like the one rule to rule them all. Like, is there something that just brings the whole of it together? And Jesus answers by quoting from a, a very well-known uh, document from the Hebrew scriptures, a document known as Deuteronomy. The line he quotes is so well-known that, uh, that Jewish men and probably Jewish women and children prayed this particular line three times a day, uh, including Jesus and including the this individual, it was known as the Shema. And here's how Jesus answers. He says, the most important, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. In other words, the most important thing to get right in this life the most important thing to get right is the full devotion of the whole self, like heart, soul, mind, and strength, the, the, the alignment of the whole self moving Godward in love. And then before the guy has a chance to process it or say anything back, and Jesus says, oh, and the second one, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. It's like, second one, oh, hold on, Jesus. I didn't ask for two. I just asked for the one. Jesus is like, hey, good news. This is the, like, today's a twofer. It's a BOGO. You get two for the price of one. But here's what Jesus is saying. These two, these two commandments are actually two sides of the same commandment, two sides of the most important thing, two sides of love. And according to Jesus, the, really the most important thing to get right in this life, it has this personal dimension, but also an interpersonal dimension of a private dimension, if you will, and a public dimension. It's vertical and it's horizontal and that those two are actually inseparable. And the idea is that in this whole uh, integrous, well-lived life, the one actually flows into the other. And so uh, today we're beginning a brand new series called healthy and whole, the 90% that shapes your life. And it's a series about physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health and wellness. And the premise of this series, and really the assumption of what Jesus said in those famous lines, is, is that the one really gives shape to the other, that our inward personal or private lives, if you will, give shape to our public interpersonal and outward lives. Kind of like an iceberg, kind of like this picture right here. It said that only 10% of an iceberg is actually visible above the surface. And the 10%, or you might say our 10% lives, represents how we conduct ourselves, what we say, what we do, what others hear and see, how we relate, how we react, how we spend, how we serve our outer lives. And the 90 percent, the 90 percent is that part of our lives that for the most part, other people don't really always see. In fact, we ourselves can't always even see it or aren't always even aware of it, but it's giving shape to and determining the health of the 10 percent. And that's really what this series is all about, our physical and mental, emotional and spiritual health that gives shape to our whole lives, our outer lives. Now, we tend to think of these four categories as very distinct and separate categories. There's our physical health, you know, maybe, maybe I try to take care of myself or, or maybe I don't so much, but I know it's there. And then there's my mental health and my emotional health. And maybe I think of those sometimes as being somewhere similar, or maybe I don't really think much about them at all. And then there's my spiritual health. And that's the part, well, that's all, you know, that's the part that's about God and, and faith and what I believe and morality and my mission and, and so forth, things like that. But, but they're, they're distinct, they're, they're unconnected and really unrelated to each other. And, and though we kind of think of these four categories like that somehow, in, re, in reality, here's what we all know. The four overlap. They are all, they are all overlapped. That this idea that they're separate is not true. Take, for example, and this is well-known, stress and anxiety. 
You've heard this before. They take a toll on you mentally. They, they take a toll on you mentally consuming your thoughts, actually limiting your cognitive function. High levels of stress actually shut down the higher functions of the brain. At the same time, it is so toxic to you physically. It affects your cardiovascular system, your immune system, even your endocrine system, like your skin is affected by your stress. And it's toxic spiritually as well, which is why Jesus had so much to say about anxiety and worry and so forth. In the same way, bitterness and hate and unforgiveness are toxic to your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And Jesus and the first followers, his first followers talked about this so strongly that if I hold on to hate and bitterness and unforgiveness, I really can't have a relationship with God. I might think I have a relationship with God, but bitterness and unforgiveness, it's so toxic that it actually keeps me from experiencing the grace of God, which is what having a relationship with God is all about. It's that toxic. And by the same token, and you like, we all know these kinds of things are true, that how we treat our physical health exercise, diet, hydration, sleep, and so forth has a constant and tangible effect on our brains, our cognitive abilities, our stress levels, our moods and emotions, and our ability to respond to God and what he might be calling me to do in a moment, that if I'm in pain physically, it's really hard to think about anything else. And you know, if you've ever had a migraine, you wake up with a migraine, it's really hard to feel compassion for like anybody else or anything else. And if I lack physical energy and stamina and strength towards the end of the day, as the day's winding down, it's really hard to have the emotional bandwidth necessary to deal with these annoying people I live with who are crying and screaming and getting on my last nerve. And the thing is, my physical life and my mental life, my emotional life, my spiritual life, these four dimensions are overlapping and integrated and they, they give shape to that public or interpersonal life. And so this June, uh, for the next four weeks, and actually our small groups are gonna be tracking through a lot of this information as well in some discussions. The, the, we're just gonna take the next few weeks to talk about that. And we're gonna begin tonight with the one that might seem most unrelated to the others, our physical health and physical well-being. And, and I, I think I've been thinking about this. When it comes to our physical health, there are really like two extremes, if you will. And on one extreme, you might say there are the, there are the appearance addicts. They, these are the people, you know who they are. They're like obsessed with the physical dimension of their lives and, and how they look. Maybe this is the fitness freak or the health nut. And it's like their, their whole daily rhythm them just revolves around workouts and diets and supplements and, and nutrition and so forth. And it's like, it's, it's the main thing that exists in their lives, even sometimes to the detriment of their relationships, like body sculpting and six pack abs and the perfect bikini body and selfies in the mirror. And it's like that constant, not that there's anything wrong with that, not that there's anything wrong with it, but uh, at this extreme, someone might end up spending a lot of time and a lot of money, a disproportionate amount of time and money on their body and a appearance and clothes and looks and so forth. And maybe it even reaches unhealthy extremes of eating disorders and multiple cosmetic surgeries and injections of Botox or, or steroids. Again, not that there's anything wrong with that. And, and with that, sometimes financial debt or imbalance, a depression over signs of aging, even a, an attempt to deny the signs of aging. And you just got to go like our culture, American culture, Hollywood driven culture, social media driven culture feeds our obsession with this right here, with our appearances and fitness and body shape and youthfulness. And, and that on one extreme, there are those who lean that way. But then on the other extreme, there are what we might call the couch potatoes. Like, you know who you are. This is the person who neglects their physical health. Now, for any number of reasons, for whatever reason, maybe it's ignorance, or maybe it's willful ignorance. I don't, I don't know and I don't wanna know. Uh, or, or maybe it's a struggle with self-discipline or self-control or various appetites and addictions, self-defeating beliefs, family history, family culture, apathy, indifference. For whatever reason, 
they have neglected this part of their life. They, they, they don't move around much. They don't exercise. They don't get active. They have a sedentary lifestyle. They don't eat right. There, there are things that they put in their body that are just poisons from smoking and drinking to various meds and pills and po- uh, junk food and processed sugar at a level that's just it's just bad for them. It's just really bad for them. And with that, is, they're often like unhealthy levels of stress, unhealthy sleeping habits. And if this is like your doctor warns you, your family warns you, your spouse, your kids, whomever, they warn you. And your motto is, I know, I know, I know, I know. But, but you've just grown to accept it. That this is just a part, this is just the way I am. My, my mama was this way, my mama's mama, my mama's mama's mama, all the way back to Eve. Like this was just, this is part of our story. And this is just, and, and maybe the line starts to be, you know what, this is my life. And I'm going to enjoy my life. This is what I enjoy. I'm going to eat what I want to eat. I'm going to drink what I want to drink. I'm going to consume what I want to consume. I'm going to watch what I want to watch. I'm going to sleep when I want to sleep. I'm going to do what I want because it's my life and it's my body and it's not hurting anybody else. And then often for religious people, there's this added dimension that kind of says, my body doesn't really matter. Like my body doesn't, so God doesn't really care about that stuff right there. I mean, he's all concerned about the soul and the spirit. And as long as I have my beliefs right and my morality right, then I can treat my body any way I want. And when I die, I get a new one. So what difference does it make, right? Now, nobody here is on either one of those extremes. I know, I know, I know. I'm talking to people who aren't here, but we know people. And in fact, however far you are on either one of those extremes, we know people who are worse than us. Like I might, but they, I mean, they are, it's not me, it's not me. But we all, isn't it true? We all probably, in fact, you might already know, we all probably lean towards one side of this extreme or the other, lean in one direction or the other. I want to ask you to raise your hands. Sometimes ping-ponging back and forth between the two. Hello. Like for some of us, our story is, yeah, I was a neglector. I was a couch potato. I was really unhealthy. And then I swung way over and I just got extreme and I was, okay, I wouldn't have called it that, but I was, yeah, I was what you just described, this appearance addict. And then maybe something happened like covid And before you knew it, you were sitting on the couch wearing stretchy pants, eating bags of Cheetos and binge watching Tiger King. It's like, what happened? And then that was a year and a half ago and and it never swung back. I mean, so some of us, like that's just our experience. There's this back and forth. There's this ping ponging effect between the two extremes. Two extremes, most of us are in the middle or back and forth between the two. But here's the question you might be asking and reasonably so, why are we talking about this in church? What's this got to do with God? I mean, my body is my body and my spirit is my spirit and God cares about souls. But what does he care about my body? Now, what's interesting is that way of thinking, that kind of dichotomy isn't new. There was an early follower of Jesus. He's rather famous. He's known as Paul or the Apostle Paul. And he addressed this way of thinking in a letter that he wrote to the Greek city of Corinth. And Paul writes this letter 1 Corinthians responding to a letter that they've written to him where they're raising a bunch of issues and they're challenging him on some things and, and, and the process of pushing back on things. They've raised an issue with Paul that actually surfaces this kind of thinking, this kind of thinking. The, the, the issue is different. The thinking is the same. And it's, it's, it's sometimes referred to as Greek dualism. So in Greek thought, there was this, there's what is known as dualism. It begins with Socrates and Plato and then Aristotle. And the idea goes like this. There's the physical... And then there's the spiritual. And the two are really separate. They're really separate. They're, they're, they're disconnected. They're unrelated. And the physical is what's down here. It's bad. It's defiled. It's temporary. We all want to escape it. But the spiritual is pure and good and it's eternal. And those two aren't really related to each other. And so when these Greek follow, following uh, men and women begin to follow Jesus, they bring this thinking with them, as we all do. We bring our cultures and our ways of thinking with us into following Jesus. And they bring this way of thinking with them that the body really is of no significance. In fact, in some ways, it's a hindrance to the spiritual. And what Paul writes is in response is so beautiful and so profound. And I hope it will forever change the way you think about your body and God. Now, he begins with a statement 
that they're saying in their letter, he's quoting their letter in defense of their particular argument. And it's my, it might actually be something that you've said before too, like to people who are pushing back on you. Uh, and it goes like this, hey, um, I have the right to do what I want. Like I've got the right, I have the right to do anything. I have the, it's my body, it's my body. I have the right, I have the freedom to do anything. Paul, you're always talking about freedom and how when we follow Jesus, we're free. Well, I am free and I have the freedom or the right to do this. And then sometimes we add the qualifier, as long as it's legal or as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, I have the right or the freedom to do this. And Paul responds with something that we all, we all know this. You might have the right, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything, not everything that you even have the right to do is actually helpful for you or for other people. And if you're a follower of Jesus, this idea is an absolute, by the way. This, this is a guiding principle. We are not governed by our rights. We are governed by the law of love. What is helpful to others and what is helpful is what guides me, not what is legal. This is a guiding principle. But even if you're not really a follower of Jesus, I think you would agree that the better question, the better question is not, is it legal or do I have the right to do, but is it helpful? Is this helpful? Is this beneficial to others? Is it beneficial to me? And then he addresses that same line of thinking with a different observation. I have, yeah, I have the right to do anything, but I, speaking for himself, I will not be mastered by Anything. And again, here's something we all, all know is true. And many of us have discovered firsthand that our appetites, that we indulge in our freedom, eventually become our masters. Our appetites, which we indulge in our freedom, eventually become our masters. And so often the choices that we make in our freedom, exerting our freedom, I'm free, I am free, I have the right to, ultimately end up enslaving us, consuming us, controlling us, and taking away our freedom that we love and cling to so much. I'm free, Paul says. Oh, I'm free. Absolutely. I have the freedom. I have the right. But not everything I'm free to do is actually helpful to do or beneficial to do. And not everything I'm free to do will leave me free in the end. And I will not be mastered by something I chose to do in my freedom. And then Paul quotes another thing that they're saying. He says, and you say, you said in your letter the, that, that food's for the stomach and the stomach for food. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food. And by the way, God will destroy them both. Now this is typical of Greek dualistic thinking, both in stoicism and in cynicism that, hey, it's just physical. I mean, it's just physical. Food exists to be consumed. The stomach exists to consume it. It's like this perfect arrangement. And the end, both are just temporary. Neither of them are ideal. The body, it's, it's, it's just physical. It's not a spiritual matter, so it doesn't matter. Now, the idea, as Paul quotes this part of the letter, is that this is what they're saying when it comes to the issue that they're actually challenging them on and pushing back that they've brought up in their letter. And it has to do with one of the most common features of ancient Greco-Roman society and cities like Corinth, and that is sex with prostitutes. Now, Ancient cities like the city of Corinth, in ancient cities, sex workers, and particularly almost all of whom would have been slaves, they were everywhere. They're everywhere. There's thousands and thousands of them. And the cultural norm and really the assumption would be that men, and it was only men, men could do what they want, when they wanted it, with who they wanted it, whenever they wanted it. And, and, and having sex with prostitutes was pretty much as common and as accessible as a cup of Starbucks and about the same price point in their world. It was a couple of bucks and it was right there and it was everywhere. And so it is safe to say that every non-Jewish male in Corinth who became a follower of Jesus. Now, within the, the Jewish background communities, they have, had a different ideal when it came to family and marriage. And so it probably would not be true of them. But it is safe to say every, every Greek background male who had become a follower of Jesus in the city of Corinth had just grown up with this. It was just part of their everyday life on one side of the equation or the other. But now they're following Jesus. Now they're following Jesus and there's this weird ideal called loving your wife, which just seems like every day for us, it was strange. Like love, 
love her. I didn't even pick her. Like, why? I don't, you don't love your wife. And the idea of marital faithfulness doesn't even exist. Like, I have children with my wife. I provide for my wife and she takes care of my children, but I don't love her. I'm not faithful to, that's, what are you, where do you get off with that? And so this was yet another way in which followers of Jesus would have just stood out as weird in society with their neighbors and their colleagues and their fellow family members. And so they're just arguing. They're just pushing back frequently through this letter of like, what's wrong with this? I mean, what really is wrong with this? And their argument apparently is food for the stomach, the stomach for food, sex for the body, the body for sex. It's just a physical thing. I mean, it's just, it's just my body. It's just like, a, it's an appetite, Paul. It's like food or drink. It's just another appetite to be satisfied. Nothing to do with anything else. And Paul, Paul is saying to them, you not only misunderstand the nature of what it means to be free, you misunderstand the nature, the purpose, and the function of your body. And here's what he says next. This is, this is really quite profound. The body, however, is not meant for porneia, which is their word, which we get the word pornography from, their word for that, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In other words, God actually designed sex. He designed it as not a kill joy. He designed your taste buds, by the way. He designed the pleasure centers of your brain. How cool is that? And God has designed sex to be this beautiful, healthy thing within the context of the mental, emotional, and spiritual intimacy of a lifelong commitment of marriage. In that context, it can actually enhance it if a person so chooses to go down that path of being married. But outside of that context, and there's so much research on this, outside of that context, it tears at the fabric of our mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And again, there's so much research on this that it's just being completely drowned out by, the, by our society's unilateral commitment to our current cultural narrative. You will never hear it or read about it. But there's so much research that outside of that context, it just messes us up inside. And he's speaking to people who would call themselves followers of Jesus. So if you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus, this isn't necessarily directed to you. And speaking to them, he says, listen, your body exists not for your appetites, but for the Lord and the Lord for your body. And then he adds this line, and by his power, God both raised the Lord from the dead and will raise us from the dead also. In other words, so they're saying, hey, food for the body and the body for food, God's gonna destroy them both. They're both temporary. And Paul says, no, actually, the body for the Lord and the Lord for the body and God by his power has raised and will raise both for eternity. In other words, in other words, the purpose of your body is not to feed your appetites, but to follow the Lord. The purpose of your body, of your physical health, is not to feed our appetites, but to follow the Lord. And its destiny is not destruction, but resurrection. Now, that's a killer thought. It's a killer thought. It was a countercultural thought then. It is a countercultural thought now. And for some of us, that might be a brand new thought that my body exists, not for my appetites, but for the Lord. And it is destined for eternity. And then he takes it even a step further. And he's trying to broaden their, what you might call their theology of the body, their belief system regarding the physical self and physical matter and the interrelatedness between the physical and the spiritual. And he says something next that's, that's famous. I mean, it's just straight famous. Everybody has heard this before. Some of you have even said it or had friends or family members say it who don't even know where it's from, but it's so powerful. I mean, think about this next line. Here's what he says next. Do you not know? And it seems like, haven't you heard this? Don't you? Like maybe they had talked about it when he lived in Corinth for a year and a half. Do you not know that your bodies are temples? See, now you've heard that before. You've heard people say, oh, my body is a temple. My body is a temple, to which I always want to ask, to who? To whom? Who is your body a temple for? Who does your... Well, temples, this whole idea for people in the ancient world, that's something they would have picked up on immediately because their world was just full of temples. A city like Corinth, I mean, there were temples on every corner. There were temples everywhere. And they understood the idea of temple, that temple is a sacred space. 
It's this sacred space that actually belongs to the God. It belongs to the God and everything about that space, how I treat that space, what I do in that space is all about my devotion to that God, my connection with that God, my respect or my esteem for that God. And Paul says, for those of you who have embraced Jesus Christ, you've begun to follow him. You've opened up your life, surrendered yourself to him. The spirit of God, the creator God has actually taken up residence in you, not just in your spirit, in your body. He's taken up residence in your body and it is his spirit that is now in you. And by the way, his spirit is a holy spirit, which makes you holy. In other words, far from seeing our bodies as like irrelevant and maybe at best secondary to the spiritual life, like, okay, it probably has some influence. Paul says that our bodies for followers of Jesus are actually the locus or the location of God's spirit's work in you and through you, that your body is a sacred space and you are a, like a, a temple of God walking around in the world and everything you are doing with your body is actually reflecting on or, 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 or reflecting back to the God of whom that body is a temple. And then he goes on to say, you, my friends, are not your own. You aren't your own. You don't belong to you anymore. Well, it's my body and I can do what I want and it's not hurting anybody. But what if it's not your body? What if it actually doesn't belong to you? He goes on to say, you have actually been bought with a price. You don't belong to you anymore. And the idea here is of somebody who had been enslaved, and this would, again, be a common part of ancient culture, and their freedom had been purchased. Somebody went and they found that, that person and they redeemed them. They purchased them back. Someone's life was in danger, and someone risks everything to rescue them, to save them. And God is saying, that body that you've been neglecting or, or obsessing over or idolizing or using to indulge an appetite that will never fully be indulged to quench some kind of inquenchable thirst that you have. It actually belongs to me. That's mine. It's my temple. That's my sacred space. And therefore, therefore, here's the point. Therefore, Paul says, honor God with your bodies. Bring honor and fame and, and, and esteem and respect to the creator God with your body, with how you treat it and what you do with it. Now, for followers of Jesus, this really is what this physical dimension is, uh, of our lives is all about. The point of being physically healthy and whole is nothing about appearances and being an appearance addict. It has nothing to do with fitting in that bikini. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Or washboard abs. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It has nothing to do with crash diets and fads and our nation's obsession with youth and looks or our obsession with youth and looks for whatever reason. Like, where is that coming from, right? The question for us is simply this. Does my body, does my body and the way I'm treating my body and the things that I'm doing with my body, does it honor God? Does my body honor God? And because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, because it is the locus of the Spirit's activity in this world, in me and through me, that whatever, and you think about it this way, whatever God wants to do in my life and through my life, in the lives of other people, it's going to involve my body to some significant degree. Like my body's going to be a part of that. My body is the means through which he is going to be active. Then the question that I settle on, and here's my question. It's been my question for years when it comes to this dimension of my, of my whole self. The question I settle on is this, as, as we start this series, is my physical capacity equal to the dream God has for my life? Is my physical capacity equal to the dream that God has for my life? Because my physical health spills over into my mental and my emotional and my spiritual health, which then spills over into the rest of my life because all the research shows, and we all kind of know, that our physical health determines everything from our energy levels and our stamina throughout the day to our emotional bandwidth and our cognitive capacities and our stress levels and our immune system and our lifespan and our health span, which is as important, if not more, than our lifespan. And this question means things like this. I have 
the sustained energy and physical capacity to live up to the things God might be calling me to do throughout the course of my life, but also throughout the course of my day. Like I'm, I'm able to step up and show up because my physical capacity is equal to that calling. I have the physical and emotional energy to be patient and cognitively present in, co in complex moments, including moments towards the end of the day when I really kind of need to be at my best and maybe I'm often not. And it means that my journey and my contribution here will not be cut short because of my neglect over this area of my life. Now, this really needs to be said. This is really important. There are things when it comes to all four categories that we're gonna talk about during the series, but especially in context of this category, there are things that are just outside of our sphere of responsibility and influence. Things that, that we cannot change and we cannot control in terms of our physical well-being. There are genetic factors, there are environmental factors that influence my physical health. I can't change them, I can't control them. And you need to know, God does not give me or you responsibility for things we cannot influence or change. Those things just are, but Within that range, and it is a wide, wide range, within that range of things I can influence and am responsible for when it comes to the stewardship of my body, the question is, is the way that I'm treating my body, is the way that I'm handling physical health resulting in the capacity, the sustained capacity equal to the dream that God has for my life and on any given day, or does my physical capacity at times become a limiting factor? This limiting factor in what God might be able to call me to do or what, how I need to step up in a moment or with a certain situation throughout the course of my life and throughout the course of my day, is my physical capacity equal to the dream that God has for my life or is it or is it becoming a limiting factor? Now, each week we want to take some, like give some really simple points of application because let's just assume we're all over the board. We're all over that continuum. Uh, we want to give some really simple points of application and you might already have a strong sense, even just what we've talked about so far of something that needs to change. Like I have never thought about my body that way. I have never thought about my physical health that way. I've never considered that my body is the temple through which God's spirit will express itself in my own. Like I've not thought about that. And there are probably some things that need to change. But when it comes to taking care of ourselves physically, there, there's like so much confusion. I mean, it's just all over the place. There's so many fads. There's so many conflicting messages. Like absolutely don't eat meat. Well, a little meat's okay. You should eat only meat. That's it, like ever. Dairy products are a great way to get calcium for your bones. Dairy foods are essentially indigestible to most human beings. Like it's all over the place. Eat breakfast every day. Ah, intermittent fasting. That's the way to go. Never snack between meals. You should eat about a half a dozen small meals throughout the day, all day long. You know, it's like keto and carnivore and vegan and Atkins and caveman diet and paleo and low carb and high carb. It's all over the place. There are so many confusing messages. Now, I am not a doctor, clearly, or a nutritionist, though I've been fascinated by the field for, for like ever. I want to simplify this down to just four fundamentals, four things that I think pretty much everyone in the field agrees on. Because when it comes to this area of our lives, I think there's often so much guilt and so much shame and so much futility and so much sense of like, I tried that and it didn't work. I swung over to that side of the pendulum and then I swung back. There's failed efforts and there's confusion. And so Simplify being the operative word. I just want to keep it super, super simple. I'm calling it the fab four, the fab four of physical fitness. And the first one is this, drink half your body weight in water every day. Just a really basic concept. Drink, water is so important to your physical health and your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And by the way, this one might be the easiest of the four. So I'm starting out with it. Like you could click this one off and go, all right, what you got next? But here's what you need to know. The heart and the brain are 73% water. Your lungs are 83% water. Your skin is 64% water. Muscles and kidneys are 79% water. Your blood, particularly the watery fluid part of your blood is 90% water. Even your bones are 31% water. And insufficient hydration affects 
everything in your body. In fact, it may be affecting everything in your body and you didn't even know that this is all that it was, that it could be that simple. From headaches to high blood pressure to sluggishness and stamina, energy level throughout the day to joint pain. This is how I got on my hydration kit because I'm a runner and 20 years ago, my joints were starting to hurt and I was told I wasn't hydrating enough and I started to hydrate two, three X what I thought I should. My joints are better off 20 years later than they were then. Immune systems, brain function, metabolism, di uh, your, your digestive system. It affects every part of your, life, your body because your entire body runs on water. And if you are not drinking enough water, this right here is probably just the number one thing you could do. Like just to boost your physical capacity throughout the course of the day and over the course of your life. Now, here's what this means. Half your body weight means this. Here's what they say. Divide your body weight in half. That's what the next slide is. Divide your body weight by two, and that's how many ounces of water you should drink every day. So that's just a really super simple guideline. You know how heavy you are. You don't need to tell me or write it on your Connect card. But you can divide it by half because you know how to do that, and then that's how many ounces. So it comes out to something like this. If you're about 120 pounds, uh, that's two quarts of water a day. If you're 200 pounds, that's more than three quarts of water a day, and then that's influenced by your level of activity and a number of other things. I shoot for a gallon of water a day. That's what I shoot for. So, But it's just like... That's, that's a really basic guideline, half your body weight in water a day, a day. It will change, if you're not doing this, it will change your physical capacity. It will amaze you. Number two, really, really important. Sleep seven to nine hours per night. Adolescents should be sleeping eight to 10 hours per night. Seven to nine hours a night. Now, uh, some of you young parents are like, yeah, in what world? And then some of, some of the more type A people in the room are like, I don't need that much sleep. I live on two hours. Like there's something that's really kind of weird about super driven people that not sleeping is some kind of badge of honor. It's like this pride thing, like a, a grounds for, it is not smart. It is really, really not smart. Sleep is crucial to our health across the board, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. During sleep, among other things, the brain is working very actively. It is working very actively to clear away, picture it like this, clearing away the debris from the day's work and then resetting and restoring nerve networks so that it can function better when it's fully awake. Your brain is created by God to do that every single night. It's crazy cool. And during sleep, among other things, your brain is restoring its capacity day after day. So seven to nine hours of sleep, it affects particularly your right brain. We did a series recently on the difference between the right and left hemispheres. Your right brain's ability to emotionally downregulate for mood regulation, for your, your ability to chill when you're getting stressed or worked up. Uh, it affects memory, forgetfulness, your ability to focus, and you know that. It helps our brain learn new things. It helps with weight loss, with metabolism, with immunity, with fighting disease, and long-term seven to nine hours of sleep lowers your risk of heart disease. It affects every aspect of your physical life, just like hydration, sleep is like the silver bullet, seven to nine hours per night. And for some, like that's the next box to check. Now, if you have trouble sleeping, I invite you to this little friend of mine called Google, look it up, and figure it out because you need to be getting seven to nine hours of per sleep a night and there's all kinds of you know, hacks and things to help you do that. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. So, so drink half your body weight in water, huge. Sleep seven to nine hours per night. Number three of the Fab Four, number three, and you knew this was coming, I'm sorry, but it's gotta come up. A healthy, balanced diet. A healthy, balanced diet. Now, here's where there's just so many different views. I mean, it's just, it, it's crazy. But within all of those different views, there's actually a, a few very consistent observations. And one of the primary ones is this, lots of sugar and junk food messes up your system. Just period. Lots of sugar and junk food, sodas, alcohol, which is basically sugar, junk food, fast food. It just messes up your system. Not a little bit, but on a daily basis, on a regular intake, it messes with your energy levels. It messes with your disease and immune systems. In fact, it, it impacts serious issues like diabetes, cancer, 
and uh, uh, heart disease all are affected by diet. It affects organ function, pretty much every organ function. And so I'm not gonna get into specifics of healthy balanced diet, what that might look like for you. You probably already know and you feel guilty enough about it already. But changing your diet, out of the four we're gonna talk about, it might be the hardest one of the four. It really is. It, it might be the hardest of the four, but it will have a significant impact on your physical capacity to be equal to God's call in your life. Throughout the day and throughout the course of your life, your lifespan and your health span. So number one, drink half your body weight in water, hydrate. Number two, sleep. Number three, diet. Number four, cardio. Cardio. Number four, get plenty of cardio exercise. Now, this isn't dismissing other aspects of, of exercise and physical fitness, the pillars of physical fitness, including like strength training and, and agility and fl flexibility and things like that. But here's what you know, particularly related to cardio, cardio related activities. That means activities that get your heart rate up for a sustained period of time. That cardio exercise is proven to have a, a, an effect on cancer, specifically on colon and breast cancer, a significant impact on dementia, a significant impact on dementia and dementia-related brain issues. That, did you know your brain, which is so small, it's just a couple of pounds, it's a tiny little part of your body, it consumes 25% of your body's oxygen. Your brain consumes 25% of your body's oxygen, which means a strong cardiovascular system leads to brain health immediately and in the long term, it leads to better, immediately it leads to better mood regulation. We've talked about that some, lower stress, lower anxiety and depression, higher levels of emotional health. It's why I run. It's the main reason why I run. It's all about mental and emotional health that I just wanna keep that going. And so I'm just gonna keep doing that. It plays a huge role in my physical capacity throughout the day to be equal to the calling God has for my life and my sustained energy levels. So where do you begin? Where do you begin? The answer, just to keep it as simple as possible, is walking. Just start walking. Now, the ideal if, uh, at the most basic level is 10,000 steps a day. Back up, back up. Uh, 10,000 steps a day, which is roughly five miles per day. Uh, now, that's the ideal. But you might just want to begin by walking around the block. Seriously, it's the summer, it's sunny out after you eat, like just before you sit down and binge the next 10 episodes, get out of your house, walk around the block, get some sunshine, get some air. That actually might be the way to begin. In fact, catch this, uh, Dr. Robert Thayer in his book, The Biopsychology of Mood and Arousal, now you can go to that, says this, I love this, 10 minutes of complex movement. Just 10 minutes of complex movement, which is movement that, invite, that involves the right and left sides of your body working in tandem, like walking or running or swimming or cycling, anything like that, increases physical energy, elevates moods, and clarifies thinking for up to two hours. That's how integrated and related your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health really is. So maybe it's just a 10-minute walk around the block every day is such a great place to start, but is not a very good place to stop. And here's why. Ideally, I want to get beyond that leisurely stroll that I'm having to the point where I'm walking far enough and fast enough on a regular multi-times-a-week basis that, in the words of Peter Adia in his recent book, Outlive the, the Science and Art of Longevity, he says, I want to get to that place uh, where I'm getting, I'm getting my heart rate to the point where I could carry on a conversation if I had to, but I kind of don't want to. You know that point, it's like, I'm not really out of breath, but I really don't want to talk to you anymore because I'm getting a little, and my heart's pumping. And, 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 yeah. and so I want to get to that point, and you might, you're, this might not be a great place for you to start right now, but this might be, for some of us, really the next step because you go out for those leisurely strolls and you're walking along and you're talking and you're having the conversations. But if you want to benefit, truly benefit from the cardiovascular part of this exercise in the ways that I described, it needs to not be a stroll, but like a brisk walk for about a half an hour to get your heart to that point. Now, there's a lot more that can be said about all of this, and I'm probably not the one to say it, because again, this isn't necessarily my field, but here's what it comes down to. And I just want to keep it simple. I just want to boil it down. For me and for you, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, here's what it comes down to. It's really simple. Does my body and the way I treat my body and the things I do with my body, does it honor God? Does this dimension of my life honor God? And maybe for you, something really obviously hit you today. While I was talking, maybe it has something to do with the Fab Four, like, I got to do that. I'm going to start doing it. Or maybe it was completely unrelated. It was like, 
something hit you and you realized, I have not been thinking about this dimension of my life the way I need to be thinking about this dimension of life from the context of wholeness and my relationship with God. I want to have a physical capacity that is equal day to day and through the course of my life that is equal to how God calls me and his dream for me and what is available for me to step into at any given moment. I want my physical capacity to not be a limiting factor. So there's something you need to do about it. There's a, there's a next step, pun intended. There's a next step for you. And here's what I want to suggest to you. If something has come to mind, if there is a next step, I want you to write that down on your outline. Just take it. There's a space on your outline. It's like, ah, I'm going to drink more water or I need to let that area of my life go. That does not fit with the temple of God. So maybe there's something and you need to write that down. And then bonus round, bonus round, show it to the person that you're with. Just go, hey, here's mine. What's yours? Like, I'm going to show you mine. Here's my next step. What's yours? Like, show it to the person you're with. And then, bonus, bonus round this week, take the next step. Actually do something about it and then come back next week. We're going to pick up the conversation right there with our mental health. Let me close in prayer for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, I want, to, I want to thank you for always loving us enough to tell us the truth. And there's no shame that you dish out and there's no guilt. And you're, you're, you just... You just want to speak to the parts of our lives where we need to hear you. You want to break through walls that we build up between ourselves and you. You want to shine light into dark corners where we're hiding. And you want to bring truth because that truth, when we lean into it, it ultimately sets us free. And so we just want to say yes to you. In any way you've spoken to us tonight, whatever we needed to hear, we just pray that you'll give us the ears to hear it, the eyes to see ourselves honestly and not hide then the grace, so much grace we need, especially sometimes in this area of our lives, to, to bring that in, what we can influence and what we're responsible for, not what we're not, and take the next steps that you're calling us to do. Give us the courage and maybe even the community, the tribe around us to help us take those steps so that our physical capacity will always be equal to the dream that you have for us. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's a powerful Powerful thought right there. Well, hey, uh, I want to thank you all for being with us today. And before we wind down, uh, a couple quick things to remind you about. Uh, by the way, uh, some of you, you're going, hey, I got to drink how many pounds of water each day? And you're figuring out, <laughs> but now ounces, there you go. Because you're like, better start now. Uh, well, hey, uh, that Connect card we mentioned a little earlier, love to get this from everybody. Uh, again, uh, we just love hearing from people and just knowing how to support, how to walk with you. And so if you've got questions, prayer requests, things that you want to loop us in on, we'd love to hear from you. Again, if you're a guest, this would just be a great opportunity for us just to follow up. And thank you for being with us this weekend. Uh, and one of the things that you might indicate on that Connect card is if you're interested in getting baptized next weekend. We've got a baptism next Sunday. And so if that's a next step that you're ready to take, then you can just write baptism me somewhere on that connect card. We'll get that from you. And uh, for those of us who call Terra Nova home, we just have this dream of being a community that constantly looks outside of ourselves and looks to show the love of God in practical and tangible ways, however we can. And we always know and we always say that we can always do so much more together than we would ever do on our own. And yet we get to show up individually. And so uh, for those who call Terra Nova home and want to jump in, you can give by utilizing this offering envelope. You can give online and you can also use the Terra Nova app for that. And as we're wake, making our way out, anything that you want to leave behind, whether it's that envelope, connect card, uh, anything you want to recycle, our guest services members are going to have uh, baskets at the door. Well, they'll grab those things from you on your way out. Um, but one more thing before you head out, and uh, you probably noticed that we have these cards on your seat. And I would encourage you, uh, because I bet that there's something that happened today as we gathered that you want. You know what? That was actually really good. That was helpful for me. I'm glad that I was here. And I imagine that there are people in your life who you'd say, I bet they would dig being here. I bet that there's something that, that they would really connect with or resonate. And maybe it's a message or maybe it's just the people who are here. So I would encourage you, take one of these cards, put them in your wallet, put them in your purse, and let's look for opportunities this week where we can connect with people and say, hey, you know what? I'd love to invite you to come to Terra Nova with me. And so uh, with all that said, I want to wish you all a great week. Uh, by the way, we got our kids who, they had shave ice today. If you'd like to treat yourself on the way out, it's mostly water. Uh, so you can do that on the way out. Um, but you guys have a great week. We'll see you back next week for part two of Healthy and Whole. God bless you all. Take care.